Welcome to uh, episode 49 of Quarantine in what may be the most profoundly liminal moment uh, we've experienced. Uh, talk about being in the middle of a change and not fully comprehending it. That's kind of what we wanted to get into today. Uh, hi, this is Peter Hirschberg, and here is our co-host, Mickey McManus. Hey, Mick. You know, in, hey, the, in the whole time we've been doing this, this this is the first time that that all day long we've been wondering what the story is. Do we know where we are headed? You know, we could have done something that went deep on the vote and the questions of all the legal challenges and that chess game. Uh, but but here we are where we think we see an outcome, but we're not certain. And so today's show is really on kind of stepping back and understanding a little bit about what happens or what happened kind of how we understand we that we might have an America with less gridlock, you know, more uh, a, a more approach to things, and then stepping back even further and understanding how we may reframe some of what we look at it. Um, well, and, and I why, think, you ahead. know, one of the things that happened was, you know, during the course of the week, we were like, okay, the whole point of this weird uh, time capsule diary study that we're doing called Quarantine is to capture the moment and to see the evolution since we started it, you know, when we were all sheltering in place and we were really torn between, you know, how deep do we want to go into the moment by moment count and all the rest going on at this moment? Or could we say, look, something's happening and the signals are signaling that maybe we have to we have to start thinking about now what? Where do we go? And I think our guests are are sort of perfect for this to help us make sure that we pull our, our eyes away from the doom scrolling and kind of look a little further out and, and say, okay, you know, we, how, how, what can we do? And let's talk a little bit about who's on today and then we can dig into it. So joining us today is Cordell Carter from the Aspen Institute. Uh, welcome Cordell. Cordell was Hi, with how are you all? terrific. You were with us on our July 4th show, which we, called We Hold These Truths, and you help us both re-examine the American idea and doing so in the middle of a very different time, a difficult time in race relations and, and uh, police violence and such. We've asked you back today because um, at Aspen, you both take an historical perspective and you've been thinking through a lot of solutions. So mm -hmm. we're turning to you for perspective. Also joining us today um, is to Dr. Kat Shirer. Welcome, Kat. Hi everyone, how are you? And hey Kat, Kat, how are you doing? Hey Kat, you're you've been doing work at the intersection of ethics and gaming, which is fascinating. We spent a lot of time talking about gaming and mechanism design. And Cordell at Aspen, we spent a lot of time thinking about ethics. And you've been you're gonna help us think through how we can use these things to perhaps help us rethink citizenship. Yes, I have been grappling with these questions for a few decades now, and I think finally I'm starting to actually see in you know real time that these are really important questions that have an mm. impact on every area of our lives. And go ahead. Yeah, and as we go forward, I think we're going to see that gaming and other emerging uh, media you know, that's, that's the way that we connect. That's the way that we express. That's how we are in public. You know, th they are publics, right? So when you yeah. are, you're practicing citizenship of, through the kinds of media that you're interacting with. And, and for both of you, to just catch you up a little bit, uh, several of our last shows have been looking at the gaming simulation digital physical interface. We had the head of AI on for Unity. Unity, of course, is a major gaming engine. We had, uh, we had uh, Timony, who runs a lot of user interface and testing for them. We had the head of digital twinning for the United Kingdom. We really, and then we had a show a couple of weeks ago with Andrew McLuhan, 
Marshall McLuhan's grandson, in which we relooked at understanding media with the idea that gaming may be the most pervasive and, you know, sucking us in format we have today, including kind of how Facebook and social media works. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is going to be a very fascinating conversation. Then our next guest who will join us in a little bit is Dr. Erwin Kula. Rabbi Kula was on with us in April in the middle of that very tough time when there was a lot of grieving, grieving and, and there was death going on in COVID. And we asked him back to almost help us take a Sabbath. If every day we're in social media that goes boom, 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 what's the slower Sabbath version that would help us understand citizenship here? So, Well, and I want to I wanna just flag to, um, I, I think people are facing a lot of grief every yeah. day. Yeah. Um, and uh, it happened to be very close to home. Um, Omid, can you pull up the whiteboard for a second? Um, so this was the whiteboard from episode nine. And it was... Uh, it was on April 17th, and um, and Irwin was kind of kind of talking to us because I had just lost my dad to COVID. Uh, he got checked into a hospital for something entirely different, and about two weeks later, while in the hospital, came down with COVID and died. And he had lived a wonderful life, but part of it was how do we how do we grapple with grief? And he talked about the mirror and the mask, and he talked about how we how we deal with narcissism, looking in the mirror, and how we deal with hiding away. And these are two quotes that I just loved from that episode. There's nothing as whole as a broken heart. And I, I feel like probably a lot of us, maybe all of us are feeling that every day in some way, or we're trying to grapple with this. Uh, maybe the country has broken our heart, you know, <laughs> maybe maybe just the, the craziness or, or more importantly, the multiple pandemics from systematic racism to, to, to COVID. Um, and, and just the vulnerability, we've had a sort of tear in the universe and that's something that, um, we have to, we have to think about how do we mend it or how do we actually understand that that tear is a part of life and how do we make reality greater than that? So, um, Omid, you can pull that back down again. I just wanted to share that. And I just am so excited to have Cordell and Kat and, and Rabbi Irwin here together. Um, Kat and Cordell, can you say just a sentence about like when you describe yourself to somebody, just what you're really passionate about? What do you say? What's what's the sentence, Kat? What would you say? Oh, you know, okay. I guess well, my Twitter name is Dr. Gamer Mom, and I think that <laughs> kind of sums up what I'm super passionate about, which is that I obviously love games because I'm a games professor and I make games and I write about games and I research games. Um, but I'm also a mom and I, you know, love my family. I love my extended family and my friends. And, you know, I care about, uh, you know, I feel like my students are my family and I'm so passionate about taking all of that care and love and giving it to the world. So I guess that's, that's me. Perfect. That's perfect. Cordell, what about you? I, I like to say that I've been chasing NPAC for 25 years. It's taken on many different forms uh, over my career, but the constant stream, if you will, is is that I'm I'm trying to make the the world better, be it a convening, be it connecting a, an amazing entrepreneur with a funding source so that they can make magic together. I uh, I create the situation. If you've ever seen the musical South Pacific, there was a character called the engineer, and I am the engineer of impact. <laughs> And you're, uh, at an, and you're at an institution, the Aspen Institute, which has really been about convening people kind of across aisles and uh -huh. for impact. And, and um, you know, it's kind of a classic non-government organization that tries to bring bright people together to go work on things and go influence stuff. Um, and Actually, other let's, let's dig in a little bit on Cordell. We'll, we'll have Kat come yeah. on back a little later. Um, and... and and uh, tell us, Cordell, yeah, tell us a little bit more about the Socr Socrates program. Uh, sure. A little background, because I think, I think you know, many people tuning in have no idea even what the Aspen Institute maybe is, or, or if they do, what Socrates is. Great. Well, the, the, so the Aspen Institute was started in the late 1940s um, by some Chicago-based industrialists that were looking to uh, prevent World War III. So they wanted to create a place where men can come together and find their common humanity. They adopted the great books uh, method of learning. And for many, many decades, uh, it was a place for 
men of great stature to come together and kind of let loose intellectually and be vulnerable together and build relationships. And in the 90s, uh, this thing called the internet was happening and um, a, a family, the, the Lauder family, uh, Gary Lauder and Laura Lauder to be exact, um, said, you know, the, the Institute has to get younger and more diverse and we need to find a way to get different people in, inside the Institute. And so they created the Socrates program. Peter Hirschberg, your co-host, was among that very first cohort that gathered in Aspen in 1996. And since then, we've grown pretty dramatically. Um, we have 8,000 alums. We have five different business lines. We are convening leaders all over the world. Um, my last week, uh, I, in fact, I was out of the country last week. Uh, but I did two Socrates seminars, one in Azerbaijan and one in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And so it, it is a, a global program. Uh, we engage people on um, the ethical dilemmas of contemporary leadership issues. And so whether you're talking about cybersecurity or the she session or um, little d democracy, uh, there are, are pitfalls for leaders. Uh, there are decisions they have to make for their organizations, for the people that they lead. And we basically practice living and existing in that gray, that gray between black and white, uh, where those difficult decisions have to be made. Mm. Uh, yeah. But we have an amazing time doing it. And well, it's pretty much so much further. I think it's interesting to point out that so much okay. of this is based on historically how we've wrestled with this stuff in in the past, right? So we start we start with you know with 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 Plato, who's looking at the role of of the individual in the group, or 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 should or should should there be a small group of people who rule us, right? We right. go through uh, the Federalist Papers, where we wrestle with these ideas oh, yeah. of liberty and community, ideas that are as current as people demonstrating right now and what they want later uh, tonight, and. Um, and you, you can also, as you pointed out before, Aspen was founded in the middle of a crisis. It was founded in the middle of the Cold War, mm -hmm. when it, it, you know Walter Pepke and 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 Mortimer Adler, you know, were worried would American business leaders have a grounding in some of these philosophical and economic things that say Marxism was founded on. Well, um, this gets me to, to a question I have, which is, Cordell, give us a sense of the kinds of people, the kinds of leaders who are showing up at these. Like you've got eight thousand alumni, who what? What's the mashup that you're getting when you get these people together? You know, give us a little well, sense of the, the. It's quite the motley crew. Uh, you have <laughs> your tech entrepreneurs, you have your financiers, the New York base, the Silicon Valley base, very different animals, by the way. Um, you have public sector leaders. Uh, we have funders that are specifically targeting public sector leaders. We have a fair amount of international uh, representation. Um, the Institute has 14 international partners around the world. So Aspen, Japan, Aspen, Romania, Aspen, Italy, Aspen, France, and on and on and on. Uh, and I try to get at least one or, or two of people from these various uh, Aspen institutes around the world to join us in Aspen when we're doing our flagship seminars. And so um, it, it is a motley crew, but they're curious, they're open, um, they, they love people, they love learning. Um, and so, uh, you know, highly literate, curious people are attracted to uh, the Aspen to in general, but specifically the Socrates program. I mean, we, we do these events over a weekend. So imagine coming into Aspen or, or Cartagena or Tokyo, uh, Friday night reception, you meet everyone, you, you figure out who the moderator is. If you haven't read your text yet, you read in the hotel that night, but for the most part, you're meeting 25 amazing people you would have never met, but for this convening, okay? Mm. Uh, and then you have four to, to five hours of seminar per day. You take a break, you go do something outside that's cultural or everybody goes to the sauna. We do something together. We have dinner and we repeat the next day. And then we uh, sum it all up with one last session before we separate and get to the airport. It's, it's an, an amazing, a uh, quick weekend trip. I, I suspect this leads to sort of lifelong friendships too, or something. You know, oh, when yeah. you get in, intense, and you're not. I, I think it's important to note that the reason it's called the Socrates program, and the reason what you do is 
everyone has to do some deep reading almost every Absolutely. night or ahead of time. But then you you discuss them. That's this great books idea from Mortimer mm -hmm. Adler and things. You you don't and and I I remember we had a, in that past episode examples of you know college kids grappling with this and it's not about teaching them you know sage on the stage. It's really peer to peer. We're trying to think about this. Let's think about and, these, you know, a wonderful these great ideas, of these great books. Mm -hmm. um, Cordell, a great yeah. example of this is the very first Socrates we had in 96 was called <sighs> Dilemmas of the Digital Age. Mm -hmm. We thought, even then, in our online knife day, mm. that perhaps these issues of technology might impact our issues of democracy. And to bring us to the present day, mm. we have just been through an electoral crisis, if I might use French, a shitstorm of possible hackings, hijackings, social media, perhaps more powerful than our brains, a, a, a mechanism that was predicted to perhaps try or tear down our institutions. We were worried this summer that there might be riots, that the Russians might take over. And, and we appear to have gotten through this, mm -hmm. not only with the democracy intact, but perhaps our most fundamental institutions carrying us through those 11,000 local electoral offices. And it's like, oh my God, that's ridiculous. There's too many of them. All those hardworking people counting the votes, even with the top Democrats and Republicans and literally protesters screaming at the door, they're like, get away, we have to count the votes. So to frame kind of our conversation now about our institutions and going forward, on the one hand, we appear to have survived something amazing in that the good news is we appear to have worked through it, although there's more to come, but the underlying issues, the pot, what social media has done to us, authoritarianism, those things still exist. So that's that's a kudos to us. Um, uh, and Well, and I think even, it's the and, invisible. I mean, what I have been very blown away with, yeah. and I, I may, maybe never doubted it. You know, my mom was an election judge no. back when I was a kid, and so we would go to the polling booths in Chicago. And, of course, in Chicago, you vote early and vote often for for daily uh, back in the day. But, you know, I, I think the mechanisms work so far, have worked, but also just the people who actually believe in the country yeah. and show up to be volunteers for poll working and things like that. So I'm super, I'm super proud of, of that aspect of it, which are the unsung heroes, really. Uh, I, <clears throat> I'm probably less, probably both of us are, are nervous about the next two or three months, as well as what do we do with this moment? What do we do? Yeah. Yeah. And, because and, I think that we can't just say, okay, let's go yeah. back to normal, whatever normal is, because there's no normal. And let's, a lot of things have been bubbled up. And, and I'm curious, yeah, take it let's from- Let's finish setting here. that up, because yeah. the good news is we've survived this. On the other hand, um, there are feelings at the extreme in this country, right? There was an awful lot of social justice and environmental <laughs> and kind of all that stuff on the left that appears to have been a bit attenuated and rejected in that you know, House and the Senate. And the passions on the right are just as great, and, and Trump may well be their leader. So I guess the question here is, we're at a fragile time. We made it through a battle, but uh, we have to resolve left and right. We have to, and, and, we, and then the question is, very practically, we may well be left with Mitch and Joe, which yeah. dancing together is kind of an interesting dance. So... So well, how does what does history teach us about yeah. this from from your standpoint, Cordell? And yeah. and well, what what are you doing right now, just in this kind of moment? I think both of those are just feel really like curious questions. Well, I, my mind harkens back to uh, the Stamp Act protest of the 1760s. You know, mm -hmm. uh, the very first version of our Declaration of Independence, which is a north star for this constitutional republic, came out of literally nine years of protests against. Uh, taxation without representation from the colonies. And so you, they had to have something. There had to be some people, uh, I think it was called the Gang of Nine, the, the representing the, the 13 colonies, uh, that uh, were articulating the fervor of the And here, I, I don't know if, if um, Joe Biden um, is a, a mirror of what's happening on the street side perhaps a, a somewhat reflection and that people want order. They want a boring president. Um, we are coming out of a truly amazing time where we have gamified incivility, uh, where the entire country was a reality show and we were all in on it. 
we, it was like the Truman mm. Show in real life. And we were living it every day and we were grimacing at every tweet and we were all into it. The reason why we felt such anxiety is because we had just fallen into the game. And wow. Tuesday night, they said, you know what? Game over. Um, there are people in this country that want to get back to business and they want something different. And so I, I see this election as a repudiation of this, this, uh, the last four years. Uh, that's what I, I see the election as, the repudiation of it, just based on the states that are uh, that flipped. Um, I think folks are very engaged in the democratic process. I'm very, very optimistic about the future because we have people that are engaging in ways they've never done before, people that have never voted that are voting before, people that, I'm thinking especially of Georgia, uh, what Stacey Abrams did you know, that election was stolen from her two years ago. Outright fraud. Hundreds of thousands of ballots just gone missing. They still haven't turned over those documents, by the way. Uh, oh. Two years later, the investigation's gone on and, and literally just wiped the servers clean. You know, literally old magnets to the server, one of those numbers. <laughs> and so clear malfeasance has happened there, but she channeled that frustration into the most epic voter outreach uh, campaign that state had ever seen. And she flipped Georgia, a red state. She flipped it. And so people like Stacey Abrams give me tremendous hope. Mm. So we're on our end, working with the highly literate, doing our seminars, juxtaposing the Declaration of Independence and what is a slave to the 4th of July and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and Hillbilly Elegy. And that's fine. If we can get people talking, I think that's tremendous. That's a step in the right direction. Get them thinking differently about the way they see politics. I want people to value people's opinions, not accredited, but I'm saying, I understand how you arrived there. I disagree, but I get how you think that way. Okay. You know, you mentioned, you mentioned a few, a few things here. But right now we demonize the other side, like it's a game. And I, and I need that. Oh, I love that frame. I mean, this idea of un, that we gamified incivility. Yeah. yeah. Um, and you mentioned, you mentioned a few things and, uh, Omid, can you pull up the whiteboard for a second? You know, one of the things that I think is kind of interesting is many people do do future future casting where they talk about like, you know, sort of the impossible, the possible, the preferred, the the whatever. Mm -hmm. But they don't go backward. They don't look in the past. Yeah. They don't go back to the 1760s and the nine years of protest of gang. They don't go go to Hillbilly Elegy. I remember um, meeting the author and seeing at the Aspen Ideas Festival a year ago. Uh, a discussion, a deep discussion about hillbillyology. And, you know, I, I have a place in Pittsburgh and proudly voted for Pennsylvania this, this, uh, this last, in the last month, uh, mail-in ballot. And, and uh, right across, I mean, you know, 40 minute drive is Ohio and the places yeah. that he talked about in hill, hillbillyology. Mm -hmm. And you can really understand why, why what's happening is happening in a, in a kind of hearkening to the good old days, even if they never existed, the good old days. Yeah. Um, yeah. The nostalgia. yeah. And, so, and I all know yeah. that we were in trouble when the greatest argument for um, uh, Trump's presidency was to take us back to some place, um, looking to the past for our future, that that's mm. a problem for a leader, uh, in my opinion, for a national leader, even if it's a figurehead. Um, but the reason I like to go back when I'm talking about a current issue is because uh, the only change that ever happens in this country is through protests. That is how things happen. It's, it's not um, fisticuffs and uh, wars. It's actually people taking to the streets. Remember what we are. We are an idea, you know, mm -hmm. idea of America. And so if we decide that this idea doesn't work anymore for anyone, guess what? Poof, we're gone. And so we, we think these institutions are eternal. They're in, they are not. Yeah. They, they exist as long as we say they exist. And so I, I say that to my colleagues in uh, bureaucracies all over this country. Woe unto you. Be very careful. This is a government for the people, by the people. And if they decide that they no longer consent to be governed by you, it's their right to to do something different. 
But that protest, that this idea of taxation without representation has, has been a consistent theme essentially every 20 years in this country from before the country even exists when it was still colonies, okay? Hmm. So um, we shouldn't be surprised that people are in the streets right now. They're on time. It's 2020. They're on time. They hmm. were in the streets in 2002, okay? So they're, they're, they're right on time. Every generation, some, hmm. something else is coming up. And so um, I feel good about it because every time they go to the streets, something better happens. We are a better version of ourselves as a country afterwards. And so I'm I'm one of the ones that are is very optimistic um, that I, I think our democracy is going to be stronger for this. You know, I I'm I, I I mean I actually I share your optimism, although I'm I'm nervous because um, because of the the vacillation, like the expansion and vacillation of um, power. So so it used to be, you know, if we went back a few hundred years, the people who could wield the most power might have been city states. Mm -hmm. um, but if we look at today, I mean, Peter wrote a book called The Maker City Playbook. It was about how you can actually 3D print things from organs to COVID-19 to whatever. And we're not talking about like a, a, a country doing this. We're talking about high school kids are making bunnies that can glow in the dark in the iGEM competition and making E. coli that smells like bananas when it's growing and smells like mint when it's ready to be harvested so they can go out and play Frisbee in undergraduate. So I think, I think I'm excited by this, but when protests have this asymmetric level where any given citizen of the United States or the world can wipe out a city by mistake. I mean, as a as a kid, when they should have a, a safe place to be able to say, "Oops, I yeah. kind of screwed up," yeah. you know. And we saw this with cyberbullying, where where yes, you might have been a bully in the fifties, but worst case, you know, maybe five people listen to you. But when right. ten thousand people on Facebook can hear you, you know, someone commits suicide from feeling cyberbullied when they're a high schooler. And right. so, I, I guess I'm both excited and I want to see protests. But I'm also worried about the precarity, the precarity of the situation. We have a form situation. of, I you guess. could argue that today we have a form of radical <laughs> pluralism, right? So we built a representative government, both because things were slower mm. back then, but we consented to have a few deliberate people help sort it out. And, and we knew that direct democracy might be a mob mess. And for various reasons, because of social media and assembling now, we're, we have a little bit of that going on. So... You know, we have, and perhaps Cordell, you can help us work through. On the one hand, we have this force of the social justice movements. On the other hand, we have a, a populist and more authoritarian movement. And these two are tough to reconcile. Earlier today, when I invited Rabbi Kula on, I said, I would love to have you on today to talk about common ground. And he wrote back, maybe that's not the question. He said, how might we establish not common ground, but higher ground? He said, perhaps polarization is healthy when we're arguing these fundamental issues. Rather, it is the splitting and the disassociation that's the problem. Our political class and media business models have exploited the polarization and forced the splitting. So is mm. how do we reconcile that? Because it is a fact that we're radically pluralistic. And yeah. I, I think we have to unite ourselves in loss, meaning uh, as follows. Mm. Uh, whether one agrees with it or not, privilege is a real thing. And I always like to put my uh, participants in a scenario. I said, I want you to imagine that you're the ruling class. So you're all white men uh, between 35 and 50 years old. You want the very best for your children. You know that perhaps things are a little easier because of the color of their skin. Why on earth would you change that if you want the best for your child? And I just, I just, and I just, call for silence. I want them to ponder that because it is a human thing, is a natural human uh, proclivity to want the best for the next generation, regardless of whether it's fair or nice or legal. Okay. Mm. That's what you want. That's when you have kids. That's whether you're a roach or a human, that's just how it is, right? You want that kid to survive and thrive. Now on the other end, if you are a social justice warrior calling for reparations in the United States of America, I think you are barking up the wrong tree. In fact, you know you're barking up the wrong tree. <laughs> you will not have one for one recompense for some wrong that was done to people who look like you. So 
loss of privilege is real and loss of this idea of complete justice is real. So why can't we hold hands together and say, listen, none of us are going to get what we, exactly what we want. But moving forward, now this is a higher ground that the rabbi speaks to. Moving mm -hmm. forward, we can agree to be civil towards each other because we're all a part of this idea of America. And it is not sustainable for us to be at each other's throats. Now, Peter, you know, I travel extensively around the world and I've been doing it for last last five years now. Um, that passport with the eagle, in fact, I have it right here because I just got back. This thing used to have a lot of power. Um, it, would, it would silence the room for all the right reasons. Um, as a business traveler, the world is very different now. They're not mm. waiting on us to get our act together. They're moving on no. beyond. Now, if you don't, if you're not, if you're not aware of our international standing because you never leave the country, you will be aware of it when when trading partners decrease or when the prices that you used to get for your goods all of a sudden goes way down. Why? There's more competition. And so we are losing ground dramatically. I, I think we're in that generation that will see the complete loss of our hegemonic status. Um, it is what it is. Every empire falls. It's not fun. I don't enjoy that part of it. It is what it is, though, right? And so we need to, as a country, acknowledge, A, that we're human and that bad things have happened. There's good facts, there's bad facts. I happen to think there's more good facts than bad, okay? And B, let's move forward to a future where we're all just going to treat each other better and we're, all, we're, we're not going to uh, attempt to put uh, any strictures on people's individual growth and just agree that we're all better when everyone has an opportunity to succeed. I think that's far more efficient and far less emotional uh, work <laughs> than, than, than what we currently have. It's, I'm exhausted by the tenor of everything right now. Well, let's talk a little bit about leadership, because in fact, we may well be moving from a leader who really was about gamification and extremes to, uh, a, a, you know, the funny thing was Trump was Mr. Dealmaker, but Joe Biden actually did spend many years in the Senate compromising, yeah. putting that together. So we're moving now towards a leadership that's more conducive to that. Um, but what do we know about making compromise or getting together sexy or putting it differently if we gamified civil discord? One reason we did it is because, like, that was a very effective great game mechanism, right? It just, uh, for all the well, reasons... captured Facebook our eyeballs and sold it yeah. to advertisers. You know, Absolutely. I mean, Facebook yeah. is going to come out more so than ever as as uh, uh, an example of why of, of why these are powerful things, and powerful things need to be regulated in some way, whatever they are. Um, I'm, I think this is a good question. I, I just want to flavor it, though, with... Yeah. You know, Cordell, you talked a lot about you, you covered a lot of ground right there. And some of our commenters online have mentioned how wonderful this conversation is. I see Netta mentioned uh, when you don't get the opportunity to have a human to human conversation, it's very easy to dehumanize the other side. And it feels like a lot of what you're doing with the Socratic effort is to try to help people not dehumanize, put a face on it. If you were the leading party, if you were the white person that looked like me, maybe, although younger, and in charge of the world, why wouldn't you, you know, do things differently? And I, and I yeah. think that's a powerful comment. And Netta is my boss, actually. So she's tuning in from New York and, uh, and, and has spent time uh, growing up in Israel. And, um, and she's been explaining uh, or ex exploring in her PhD um, cognitive biases, but also how do we regenerate cognition so we can actually have the ethical capacity to be able to have conversations and take action. And she would probably claim that um, many of these digital technology tools are in the process of game and buying incivility, are strip mining our cognition. And we have no FDA for our brain. We have no human right that says cogn cognition is a human right, the ability to think. Mm -hmm. so, so flavor this with Maybe what you're seeing leaders talking about, could Joe Biden be the person that does this in an interesting way or Kamala and Joe and the, and the crew that possibly comes in next year? What, are, what's, what gives you hope in that regard moving forward? If we look past today, you talked about Stacey Abram right now, which I think was just, I sure hope um, everyone understands what she did. It was amazing. 
But moving forward, where do we go? What's What are some of the signals you're getting? Well, you know, there's a body of work we have called Becoming an Inclusive Republic. And it was designed to, to go to places that Aspen wouldn't typically go. So, you know, mid-sized cities in the South and the Midwest and the Sun Belt. Um, and it's proven, I've, I'm using the same material everywhere I go, and it's proven to be um, an antidote to uh, partisan bickering because people rediscover just the beauty of this idea, the concept, the idea mm -hmm. of America. It, it's, you know, we're attempting to do something that hasn't been done before, a pluralistic, uh, multi-ethnic, uh, robust, dynamic democracy. We are not America without our differences, okay? Mm -hmm. the, that creative energy, that tension that comes from bumping up against something that you don't understand is what makes us great, yeah. okay? So uh, with that promontory, I, I, I say the following. I, I think the physics of this particular election are going to be favorable towards deal making for the following reasons. Number one, uh, uh, the more uh, left leaning uh, congressional representation has been whittled down. I think the Democratic majority now is five or six seats, uh, which means you have to make a deal. You have to make deals all the time to get anything through. You just can't ramrod everything. You got to keep your coalition together, right? And so that's going to mean more moderation. You have in uh, perhaps the uh, president-elect, if he's going to be announced tonight, a person that has 40-year relationships with people across the aisle. So I predict you're going to see a fair amount of Republicans in his cabinet, okay? That sends completely different signals. Mm. That's uh, brilliant. Yeah. You're saying we have to focus on making America better. Forget the so it's sort of team team of rivals approach. Uh, a Lincoln. All the rumors I'm hearing is, is that that is definitely the case. We're going to see some very familiar Republican names in this next hmm. cabinet, and so hmm. a huge, huge deal. It's a it's a, a message being sent to the country that the previous time was a blip, and we're moving forward together, hmm. both parties making this country better. And you have, I suspect, um, a lot of uh, Democratic energy that's primed to go for a special election for two Senate seats in Georgia. Yeah. Now, this is even though she turned the state blue, she has to do it again in December, which means you can't have um, any AOC clones running uh, for those Senate seats on the Democratic side. You're going to have people that are pre pretty much saying the same thing. Right. So now I have to make a choice. Do I want to give the Democrats majority in the Senate? Can they do something with it? That means everyone in the system has to communicate differently to help mm. those two special mm. elections. Right. Uh, and we're going to see that right now because the election is on for the next one. Um, so so I, I'm actually very, very encouraged at the direction of the, the federal apparatus because of the physics of uh, the election. This is a great microcosm because what you're suggesting is we may have pulled some of the energy out of the extremes. The fact that there's fewer Democrats slows that thing down. And what you're suggesting is that if you put Republicans in the cabinet, the extreme right will be perhaps flapping more in the wind because the center right is there in government. And your other point is Georgia as a microcosm, right? Because uh -huh. as, the, as the left goes to work, it can't go to work too extremely. And it will be fascinating to see in those Senate races, does Trump come down and hold rallies because he can't help himself from helping holding rallies? Or I suspect he will. He will. Mm -hmm. And yes. do you think do you think there'll be more extreme or less extreme rightness? Do you think both I, 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 what happens? He's saying crazy things because he's angry and it's not going to help the Republican candidates. So those Republican candidates are going to request that he not come. He's yeah. going to come oh. anyway. Okay. And there's starting to see a little bit of that now, yeah. yeah. So um, let me I feel like it'd be nice. Yeah, you want to bring Cat in? Well, I want to bring Cat in because you know you made two, two, two uh, wonderful comments. Are two very big framing things, which, which is, which is uh, this both move to the center or compromise. But you also talked about how we gamified incivility, yes. and yes. that whole practice is essentially gamifying ethics and civility. Mm -hmm. So tell us how you arrived at this and how this has been your life's work for a couple of decades. 
Yeah, so I am loving this conversation and I really love the phrase that you use, Cordell, which is the idea of America, right? Mm -hmm. And that idea relies on a lot of things, right? So trust, safety, care, connection. Uh, you know, we need to feel like we are a we. Right. And the other thing that you said that was so essential is that we also don't need to agree. Right. We we sh we should have different perspectives. We should be arguing and and trying to understand each other and, and kind of maybe not be, uh, in, you know, not civil toward each other. We should still be listening to each other, but we should be having a, an engagement in argument about what we should do next and how to solve problems and how uh you know how we create our future right but uh the problem is is that we have lost trust in each other right we've lost trust in our institutions and that lack of trust is making us not a we anymore hmm. and i guess for me that's where i see actually games stepping in you know it's like you uh, Cordell said, you know, we, we go to the streets to make change. And I'll say, you know, a lot of us go to the games to make change, right? And, uh, you know, you mentioned uh, the idea of gamifying, gamifying uh, incivility, right? right? And, you know, you could say, well, why couldn't we also use games to gamify connection? But I actually think that kind of reduces uh, and kind of trivial, trivializes what games actually can do. Because mm -hmm. the way I see games is that it actually does what I think it needs to do, which is that it shows the messiness of humanity. And if we are going to be continuing to be a democracy and to be listening to each other and to be grappling with our messiness, we need to expose that messiness and reveal that messiness. And games help to reveal the complexities that that are of we, right? The we, uh, the we of humanity that is very complex uh, is is out there in the publics, and the publics are are games now. Um, in addition to the streets, in addition to the other places that we are in the public. Can you know, tell I'm us about your book. Yeah, Go tell ahead. us because uh, you've been uh, that was just the same place I was going. I'm fascinated by the idea that you've been working on a new book. And yes. I just, I want to flag, I have this <laughs> massive volume of, of, uh, of cats that is learning uh, education and yes. games. And what's fascinating is, I mean, you pick up one of these and it's, mm -hmm. it, I mean, it's just, there are little snippets so you can deep dive. I'm interested in yes. how someone learns when they're like 12 about their identity, you know, and oh my gosh, sure. there's, there's something in there yeah. about that, you know? And yeah, I mean, what's nice about that book is it actually kind of came out at a great time, which was right before the pandemic, which, you know, un unfortunately we had a pandemic, but Pretty also useful we for have parents, now. teachers, yeah. Yeah, so we're now engaging in a lot of remote learning. We're finding other innovative ways to learn, to connect, to think about our identity. Could that be through games as well, right? So that book that you're holding up is called Learning, Education, and Games, 100 Games to Use in the Classroom and Beyond, right? So the classroom could be a remote classroom. It could be in person. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, it's it's 100 different, you know, you could kind of flip to any of them. And, and you know, there's everything from Minecraft uh, to, you know, much more, uh, you know, non-commercial, more indie games, uh, non-digital games, so board games as well. And a teacher, an educator, a parent could kind of, you know, flip through to see, you know, what are some games that are good for the age group that I'm teaching or uh, the, the subject that I'm teaching. And, you know, here's a game that you could use and here's how you could use it in uh, an educational format. Well, and I want to I want to just point out, like, just as an example, I mean, yes. I just flipped to P pandemic and there's actually a game you know game, that yes. has to do with you're actually the virus and you're trying to <laughs> to outgame the cdc yes. and how things are done there's another page that says fallout shelter mm -hmm. and uh, i'm just literally reading off deuce x 
Human Evolution. Deus Ex, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Deus Ex. And I remember at the conference I saw you at Games for Change in New York mm -hmm. last year, which was a beautiful conference around yes. kind of 16 year festival around games that help us actually change our mind or help us cope with Middle East peace or help us yes. with different things. Um, one of the presentations was a critical review of using a game as a text, the same mm -hmm. way Cordell Carter's and the, uh, Cordell Carter and the great books yes. were texts that carry on through from Plato forward, the great ideas. Um, they took a game that has to do with this haunted house. Mm. Is that, uh, and, yeah, is that Paul Durabasi, his uh, What Remains of Edith Finch? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's amazing what it does, yeah. And in high school, they use it as a critical text, the same way you use a book like Catcher in the Rye, where mm. the, all the kids are playing it, but what they're learning is each step inside this haunted house you are put into a different ghost yes. and you become a ghost. And you know, at the beginning of the game, every ghost dies at their own hands. And so it's about identity. Like, and as a teenager, you're grappling with how do I, how do I not just be completely an identity shaped by my peers? How do I have my own identity? Mm -hmm. And at one point, I mean, you become a ghost of a baby and you know, yes. the baby died at their own hands and you have to go through this. And they showed, yeah, that, that that was the critical text, but they showed how the kids actually in classroom played it, how they used a curriculum around identity and, and, and kind of your own agency and your ability to actually think and talk about this. Kids who would never have talked about this, but because it's in a game, it's a, it, it creates a psychological safety to explore identity as an example. Can't What's your new book? Tell me a little bit about yeah, that. So, yeah. I mean, just to, to add to what you're saying, the game is called What Remains of Edith Finch. And what's really nice about it is that you actually enter the virtual space, the room where that uh, ghost or character used to live. And so in their room, you can actually interact with kind of their their uh, personal objects and the, the things that matter to them. And their room is kind of this space of of identity, right? It, it, it engages and it, and it shows and expresses who they are. And you learn about them through interacting with the stuff they leave behind. And so the way that uh, Dr. Darvasi uses it in his classroom is that he then has the students actually bring their own objects into class to, uh, to kind of share with others and then to also create their own digital uh, artifacts around their identity and around their the objects that matter to them. So one of the examples that uh, he uses, Dr. Darvasi uses, is that you know he got to know his students so much better because of what they brought in. Like one of the students brought in a hockey stick and was able to talk more about who they are um, and who and how they connect with the world because of the way what they brought in and how they were um, able to see who they were through it. Hmm. So, so Kat, um, perfect example. Go ahead, Peter. I have a, yeah. So, um, let's say that we were to use a four-year horizon for the next election, and we wanted to create, uh, yes. uh, you, you know, move people from incivility to civility. Um, and let's say you, you, you know, you're working with the Epic Game people or with the publisher. What are the mechanisms? The intervention mechanisms are people simulating the economic trade-offs in their city? Are they simulating identity to learn about others? Is it communicating with each other? Are they playing a city game? What, well, how where, do you play kind of civics? How do you how do you learn about, about this? You know, huh? because I think a lot of people just learn civics. Yeah. I mean, I know high school kids in this house who can yeah. quote me every single thing about the different, you know, the electoral college and things like that. How do you? Yeah, Kat, yeah. I guess what have you what have you seen, and how would we play this forward if we really yeah. wanted to make an impact? Well, with your so, yeah, so, so what I did was I actually, so I wrote a book uh, about how we use games to teach ethics and civics, um, but it's actually more about how they're already teaching us ethics and civics because we're already using them in that way. Um, so there's so many different ways. I mean, one of the ways that you can use games, of course, is to relay knowledge, right, to relay facts, to um, tell us what the Electoral College is all about. But that's only one way, right? So there's a lot of other ways. Um, some other ways are to use it to uh, practice perspective taking, to use it to practice listening to other people who have perspectives that are different than our own. 
Um, it's also about how we explore our identity and express identity and learn about others' identities, as we've been talking about. Um, it's also about practicing skills like communication or to practice skills like understanding when uh, there's disinformation and the strategies that people might use to try to persuade uh, us uh, to believe in disinformation. So mm. there's a lot of different ways that games are already doing this. And a lot of it is that games are also communities, right? There are already places where people are expressing ideas. They're trying to understand themselves and how they're their, what their role is in society. And they're already trying to start to uh, listen to other perspectives and to argue their own perspectives. And, you know, sometimes it's, it's not pretty, right? It's not, it's uh, like you said, there, there might be inc incivility, there's toxicity, there's harassment. Uh, just like we have in in-person scenarios and situations on the playground and, you know, at the, the locker room and, you know, in the classroom, there's also the same kinds of things going on in our online spaces and in our gaming. Um, but that said, there's also friend making, there's connection, there's care, there's uh, thinking about other people, there is um, thinking through grief. So you mentioned how do we connect through grief? And actually last night I was teaching at my class, which is a, college level class on ethics and gaming and one of the uh one of the games that we play is called that dragon cancer and that is a game about loss it's a, about a family a real family who lost their son to cancer their their little baby son and uh and what they went through in uh not only um going to the hospital and and all the uh doctors uh visits but also how they actually handled the grief in the aftermath. And what's really beautiful about that game is that it helps them to connect with others because they're able to share their grief with others. And through playing the game, it also helps me to share my own grief and loss of a son. And so I'm able to connect with my students better because I'm able to talk more about that because we're playing the game together and we're learning about each other and our own losses together. So there, you know, again, so there's, you know, it's messy, right? Yes, there's incivility and there's harassment and, and there's, uh, you know, we need to talk about that. We need to yeah. deal with that and uh, grapple with it. But on the other side, uh, you know, you can use games for um, cruelty and for, uh, you know, radicalization and distrust. And you can use them for connection and care mm -hmm. and support and, you know, grief through, you know, grieving together. So Kat, I'm curious, yeah. um, you know, back to Peter's question, which I think is a nice uh, framing. We've got four years. Yes. What would you invest in? Like, what would you say? OK, chapter five of my new book yes. identified this, this and this. And chapter seven, we should do this at a national scale. Like if we were writing the, the letter from concerned nuclear scientists, right, right after the atomic bomb thing, you know, and we were saying, you're the new president. This is what you should do about play and civics what would you say what would your moonshot be for this well i think the first thing to do is to just have an open mind and all the ways that people are already playing and connecting Four hundred thousand uh youth and other people watched aoc stream live on twitch her and her all of other politician friends playing among us uh you know, I mean, that's people are doing this. People are connecting. People are connecting civically through games. And we need to see that it's happening, right? I mean, the first thing is acceptance that this is how we are connecting. Um, you know, this is I talked to my students and it's like they were in despair in April, you know, March, April. And what were they doing? They were playing games together. You know, they were playing Animal Crossing New Horizons and visiting each other's islands. Yeah. Uh, you know, this is what we're doing. We're we're holding our baby showers and our uh, you know our weddings in World of Warcraft, and uh, you know, I mean that's so it sort of recognized it exists, and it's a real medium for you called it a you you I I wrote this up. Games are publics. I thought that was a really interesting yeah. frame. They are. 
and and you've 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 sussed out in this new book that you're putting out these these mechanisms, but also good examples. You don't have to reinvent this. But the problem is we can't we can't sort of dismiss games as like triviality because it's play. Yes. Um, I, I remember very clearly one of our past um, uh, guests, Ting Jiang from Dan Ariely's lab at Duke, uh, who spoke at the Games Are Changeling last year. She said, play creates a safe context for you to be able to try things. It creates yes. community. It yes. creates cue conditioning. In other words, if this happens, I can practice. You said practice like five times. I love that. How do we practice it's also immediate. It can be variable rewards. So you can kind of try things. It's response rehearsal. So you can you can test out how you might do things if something terrible happens tomorrow or something great. You can learn via trial and error. And it, and and her point and the work they've been doing is around improving decision myopia. And I think if there's one thing we could describe about America right now and maybe the world is that this gamification of incivility has amplified decision Myopic, myopia, we're basically like, we don't like future us because we're making all these immediate decisions for gratification. Like, I don't like future me. Apparently I'm gonna do some horrible things that'll trash the whole environment because I just don't care about my future me. And, and, and games have been shown statistically with double blind clinical trials to actually improve decision making. And, yeah. and myopia, right? In in games around managing your money and games around, you know, dealing with things by building healthier or healthier habits. So I'm very excited by this. So Kat, it's almost like we got to take it seriously. You Mickey know? and Kat, you've both made the case that, that gaming is this powerful medium of our time that's capable of change. I'd like to invite, we have Cordell and Erwin Kula up. Uh, Cordell, of course, represents um, our great civic history and our history of ethics and change through the Aspen Institute through great books. And let's bring Erwin up. Erwin, Dr. Hi. Rabbi Kula, welcome back to Quarantine. Nice to be uh, here. Hi, everybody. So great to see you. Uh, I mean, you saw this conversation. We all first talked about grief, and 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 the cat brought that up within games. But you also represent the great spiritual wisdom tradition. So these two great traditions here, and now we have this powerful new medium well, that might affect and us. I, uh, Rabbi Irwin, thank you so much for coming back. And in this process, I reviewed kind of our episode um, when we when we got together, and, and it really it, it it really gave me uh, tools, I think, and it gave me you know comfort, and and I felt a sense of agency about you know my own grief, and I, I just I, I appreciate that because it was a completely um, you went out of your way to really help on uh, live, kind of help. We honored your me in some memory. Ways. Yeah, we and it was wonderful. But I'm actually curious. You've been listening in for a little bit about what Kat was talking about. I'm not sure if you caught much of Cordell, but you know your reflection just on what you've heard so far in the discussion, and 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 I want to make sure that we hear from Cordell about his reflection on what Kat just was talking about with, with play. Um, but what's your reflection? So uh, I did hear. Uh, so yeah. first, it's it's delightful to be here. It's great to be here. Um, I I heard I think like eight minutes of cat so I don't and I didn't hear Cordell yeah. so I apologize. Um, I, first of all, I already down I already downloaded Cat's book while I was listening to her <laughs> right from Amazon and hoping that I wouldn't be called while I was doing that. So that's the first thing I want to say. I can't wait to to read uh, your book. Um, I heard another word. I know that Mickey, you picked up a bunch of words. I heard a word messy that. Mm. Cat probably used at least three or four times. And mm. games are messy and life is messy and you argue about the rules and you, and I, I think that word is a really, really, really important word. We are afraid. We have not developed the mental apparatus. We don't have the har internal hardware to deal with the messiness that complexity creates. And that is new. And I, I, so my first reaction is, yes, Kat is so right. The more we can simulate, the more we can have places to practice, the more where we can get it wrong and it's not life or death, the more we can get it wrong and it's not the ultimate humiliation and my identity is crushed, right? But it's in a game and, and then you can start the game over or the game continues forever no matter what is in some of these games, right? The more we're giving people... Uh, we're providing people the tools 
uh, and it's about tools in the end. We, we, you know, we need like new internal technologies to deal with this messiness. And, and in, in some ways, the, uh, here's the, the biggest one for me is, is we think polarization is a bad thing. Polarization is an indication that we're arguing about really important stuff that's uh, in the Isaiah Berlin sense, incommensurate values that we need to argue out. It's not, this is the most serious thing to have polarization. The problem isn't polarization. The problem is the splitting that happens between us. And I mean, psychological or psychocultural that happens because we haven't learned to manage the polarization or because it's being exploited. And in some ways today was a very interesting day because the, the ultimate uh, projection and disassociate splitting of the entire America was Donald Trump. And, and this is not, a, I'm not making a moral claim, right? He is an example of the ultimate splitting as a human being. You could watch it. It's so, it's so apparent. So he is our projection, the collective projection of America. And the interesting thing is America said, we're not sure about a lot of stuff. Nothing's been solved in America. But one thing is we're going to have a new president. We're not sure about the Senate. It's going to maybe stay the same. We're not sure. But one thing that's happened is we can't have this. Now, this is an incredible opportunity for everybody on the food chain, right? From left to right, from up to down, from Mars to Venus, this is an incredible opportunity to say, hmm, I wonder, given, and now I'm going to go back to cat, a uh, sort of a metaphor, given that we're all in the same sandbox, and that's the truth, and we're all in the same playground. Now, some people might like a seesaw, and some people might like swings, but we're all in the same playground. There's no other playground to be in. This is the playground. How are we going to play? And I thought that that's really what Cat is inviting, at least she invited me in the eight minutes. How do I want to play? What a really... <laughs> Interesting question. How do I want to play with my fellow citizens? How do I want to play with my coworkers? How do I want to play with my neighbors? How do I want to play with the people I deeply disagree with? How do I want to play with the people that I don't understand? Because that's the drama. How do we want to play together? So I thought Kat was brilliant. And we kind of have gotten our heads to the point that if it's someone you disagree with, you're supposed to go to war with them or be obstinate or not listen, right? I mean, that's that's a little bit what this in, uncivic rehearsal has. I don't actually of. believe most Americans are like that. See, I think that that there's external, just like most people who play games don't kill each other during the game. Most people, <laughs> even when they argue about the rules, even big adults, and when they're when they're arguing about the rules, very rarely do they do they take out a gun and kill each other, right? We are getting a algorithmic manipulation for a whole variety of reasons that have to do with cognitive science and that have to do with business models that are presenting us. It was as if we watched, it's as if we watched two people, uh, a group of people play a game. And the only part of the game that we saw was the most vicious arguments, right? We'd yeah. say, what's going on here? That's what yeah. we're seeing. Now that's a literacy question. That's a psychological or a, or a, or a, or a informational literacy question. Uh, which is why it's so interesting to play games because you're going to become literate about how to f fight the messiness in a game. The so real I don't, I don't win. believe we're as polarized. 70% of I, Americans agree on every major issue, at least two or three policies. Well, right? and I want to flag one thing you missed when before you joined. Um, Cordell did a wonderful job of uh, articulating that, in effect, we've gamified incivility. Mm-hmm. And and that was a, a kind That's of a what moment I meant by the business that he model. really yeah and I think it, it it resonates with what you just said, um, Rabbi Irwin. Could you maybe just tell our our audience maybe they haven't seen you in a past episode or anything, but give us just a sentence about you. Who are you? I'm a, <laughs> who, I'm, I'm a seventh. What are you generation. doing? What, yeah, I know. What, what are you doing? excited yeah. about or what are you passionate about? What do you spend your time on? I uh, I'm a seventh generation rabbi. I live in New York City on the on the Upper West Side and. I think every single day about the intersection of religion, um, uh, innovation, and the sciences of human flourishing. So that's mm. what I do every single day, thinking about that intersection. And um, so, and if there was one more sentence, is I am passionately interested in the jobs religion historically got done, knowing full well that institutional religion is going to incredibly weaken in the next uh, decade in this country. A third of all institutional religion is going to go out of business. I actually don't care about that, but I care desperately about the jobs 
religion historically got done. And one of those jobs, when it was working well, was to allow us to play together. And there's mm -hmm. and religion itself is one of the great early forms of play. It's not like you looked up at the windows and you got to play, right? You you entered into a holiday and you played, you made believe. But but when you really are playing a game, and I think that's what's so interesting about, you know, different than a board game, the sorts of games that Kat is talking about, you are immersed. Well, religion was a very, very early uh, form of, of the gamification so you can practice life. You practiced redemption. You practiced mm. charity. You practiced, right, um, the great sort of archetypes of life. Yes. Can I ask a religious question related to now? You know, in this last election, um, a number of people uh, who identify as religious evangelicals were, religion amplified the fact that they were convinced that they were right, right? They even came mm -hmm. out and said, God is God's candidate. And one of the weird things about religion is because it's based on faith and because you absolutely believe it, religion itself can be a, a mechanism that can set people apart because they know they're right and you can't argue with that. How do we work through that? And you must have to deal with that dilemma all the time. And I just watched it up close in this whole election. And I'm wondering how you help us understand that. So there's a, there's a lot of different layers that are too yeah. much. That's like a whole of the show. But yeah. Because or a few part, books. Yeah. yeah, a few books. And part of what's happening, which I'm sure, though, it, I, I looked up Cordell, so I, I didn't hear him. Part of I'm sure Cordell could do a better job than me on the stacking of identity, what's happened in, in the weakening of all forms of identity, um, and so that po politics has become a mega identity for people. And once politics has become a mega identity for people, right, all the subsidiary forms of identity, all the other webs of relationships, mm. right, become proof text, the most powerful proof text for an existing identity is religion. And so what you right now have, and it's, and, and by the way, it's very sad because we're, we're, we are going where, you know, they say that a third of the entire institutional religion community, right, will be out of business. It's a $1.4 trillion business in the country and a quarter of it's gonna be out, of, quarter to a third is gonna be out of business in the next decade, according to the economists. So, so these are very serious things. Religion now, for the most part, is used as a legitimation of one's existing political and psychological positions. Mm. Now, once you know that then, the issue, and this is the question, the issue is not to argue about the religion, but to try to understand what are people really arguing about. So when a person who's what we, call, let's call it a fundamentalist conservative um, Christian is, is arguing about creation against evolution, they're not arguing a science argument. Because the person they're arguing with who uh, on the liberal side probably couldn't give you 10 sentences about evolution, though he believes in evolution. And the, person's, the person on the creation side couldn't give you 10 side, 10, 10. So they're not arguing about that. They're arguing about a deeper, right, incommensurate sort of uh, trigger that that argument is doing about how to be in the world, how to play the game. It's not, a, it's not about what we're arguing, right? It's much deeper or much higher. And that's why I say the issue is not common ground, the issue is to discover higher ground. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, um, uh, just Cordell, you've been quiet for a while and you've heard a little bit of what Erwin's up to and, and what Kat's up to. What's your sort of take from the from the process you run, you know, with the Socratic process at the Espen Institute? Well, there's a consistent theme across the three of us and that is of, of practice. Uh, hmm. I'm old enough to remember life before the internet. Uh, before dating, before dating apps, you actually had to go and ask someone, do they what? want to stop hop? And they may reject you and you get crushed and your, your buddies laugh at you, but yeah. you feel the emotional and spiritual musculature to contend with disappointment. Mm. And in our, our highly uh, digital world, uh, we are practicing indeed, but we're not getting the same physical uh, reaction because we know this is a game. Okay. I have to get across from another human being like in religion, like in a seminar for me really to understand like how to read the room. Did something I say offend them? Did they switch? To, did their body language change as a result of something I said or a look that I gave? That's impossible in some gaming environments, uh, unless the avatars are much better than I think we are. Uh, so practice, practicing humanity is something that we're going to increasingly see premiums for. Places like the Ass Institute are going to grow. I think people are going to run to religious institutions because they want out of this mess. Hmm. 
You know, so, um, now, I also want to note we're a little after the hour. So if anybody has to leave soon, um, you know, we're we're running into overtime. Um, and uh, yeah, Kat, I know you you probably have to cut out pretty soon. Uh, uh, any last comments, actually, Kat, before we before we we continue into overtime? You know, I'm just loving this conversation. I love the fact that we are playfully arguing and engaging with this. And I think this is it. You know, this is us uh, be, play, playing together, right? We, we are grappling with the messiness that is our time, that is our place, that is our world. And this is it. I mean, this is, this is what uh, I think we are meant to do. So thank you for having me. Thank you. When does the book you, come out, book? Kat? When is your newest one coming so out? So that's a great question, right? So <laughs> it's supposed to come out next year. Uh, look for it on uh, your normal online booksellers, and it will also be on the Oxford University Press website. And, and what's the name one. of the book again? Well, okay, so there's a yeah, secret, the name? secret name that I'm not telling anyone yet. Um, it is TBD, but the subtitle is How Games, uh, How Games Teach ethics and civics. Oh, so I think perfect. this is wonderful because you've put on the table that gaming technology, one of the most powerful inventions we have, has the possibility to push us into civic practice. Yes, and or it already is. We're, already, it is. we're already doing it. <laughs> Even though yeah. we've read that it's it's like the uncivic part of gaming that, that kind of identity oh, stuff went off. Thank you so much. And yeah. we want to get back to you and continue this. Yes, um, definitely. Thanks, Kat. Have a good Great. evening. Thank Cordell. you. Bye, everyone. Stay Bye. healthy. Stay well. Cordell, Bye. Erwin, uh, thanks. I want to pursue this notion of civic practice for a moment because each of your sides of the equation, the spiritual side and the civic side, have so much to offer. And Cordell, when we think about some of the people who come through Aspen, we have Eric Liu, who leads Citizen University, who talks mm -hmm. about civics almost in religious terms. We have Robert Putnam, who wrote Bowling Alone, and whose new book about I and we talks about how we might recapture the American civicness that, say, Tocqueville looked at. Mm -hmm. And then also part of our community at Aspen, we've got people like uh, David Brooks, who's been and 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 uh, who's been concerned with this stuff. Uh, and I'm wondering how you might frame some of the Aspen thought leaders and the work that's going on to create civic practice that you see all around your world. Well, we have a combination of uh, thought and practice. So you, you have the thought leaders that you mentioned, but you also have um, civics in action. You think of Ann Mosley's program at then, where you're looking at three generational approach to eradicating poverty. You look at um, Maureen Conway's work with the Economic Opportunities Project, where this is from the employee's perspective on how to um, maximize your utility uh, in labor. Uh, you, you look at uh, Ida Rademacher's work with financial inclusion. How do we contend with the great unbanked in this country that's not benefiting uh, from these amazing services that we have that no one else has? And so we, I think the, the, the sub um, brand of our organization is ideas, people, or ideas, action, and impact. Uh, we try to live that with our various programs. Cordell, what, um, you know, over the history of Socratic, uh, the the Socrates program, and you know, we mentioned that Peter was there for the very first one. Uh -huh. uh, you're seeing this with 14 partners around the world, 8,000 alumni um, from going through the program. What are the kinds of impacts, like when you go back and measure success of the program of of, of Aspen trying to host this conversation? Uh -huh. It's a messy conversation. What are some of the ways you measure success? Well, for one thing, uh, I, I think immediately of last March in Colombia, we were the first Aspen Institute program to do anything in Latin America. Well, by the time we left Cartagena that weekend in March of 2019, uh, people at that seminar decided to create an Aspen Institute Colombia. And today I tell you that it actually exists. There is an Aspen Institute in South America. It did not exist prior to Socrates going there. There are, are many, many examples of people meeting at Socrates, collaborating, building new enterprises. Um, and so uh, I measure impact uh, mostly through testimonials. I'm, I'm interested mm -hmm. in how your thinking has evolved. I've, I've put a, a tremendous amount of effort in recruiting 
um, Trump supporters, recruiting folks from the South, people that aren't on the Aspen map or, or would not typically come to Aspen. And it's made for some very interesting bedfellows, you know, um, you know, a whole crew of, of Heritage Foundation leaders with, you know, folks from San Francisco, they would have never met and normally, um, but they are Socrates alum. And so they have that bond mm -hmm that they've had that common experience together and they're part of each other's world as a result. And that you, that you can't help but be different when you've met the other side and you realize they're just like me, they just think differently. Okay, I get it, okay? And so I think mm -hmm. it, it, um, it softens uh, your, your vigor to go after uh, triggering mechanisms for people you deem on the other side of you. Well, this reminds me of what, what Rabbi Irwin said around this sort of the splitting um, because ultimately, when you can when you can subdivide and split and balkanize and kind of you know create separate little identity silos, um, in a sense, you're you're creating the other. And what when you're you doing can create the other, you can objectify the other. You know, you can say that thing isn't a real thing. That's a you know that's a person, but I don't really think of them as a person once I turn them into an object. Right. So you yeah, see, maybe what's your reaction on this? See, so what, I what think are you thinking? What is if we could take a step back, the reason that we split and otherize, and, and, other, and otherize is just another version of splitting, is and so that whatever our shame is, whatever our shortcomings are, whatever we're guilty about, whatever our flaws are, where wherever is that gap, it's it we dis split it and disassociate and project it on mm. the other. Right. Oh. The reason we do that, and we do that personally, and then we do that culturally in groups. The reason that I mean. The, the fundamental reason we do that is it is less painful than actually dealing. And, and so mm. it's a adaptive, not, a, not right now a very healthy adaptive strategy, but it's an adaptive strategy to dealing with real serious unconscious pain and guilt, etc. It's easier for me to split off and see that person as, right? Now, whatever I see them, a greedy da-da-da-da-da, a rich da-da-da-da-da, a uh, homophobic da-da-da-da-da. It's easier for me to do that than to ask myself, why am I doing that? I am blocking, unconsciously blocking mm -hmm. something that is identified with the very critique I'm making. And that, that is happening now culturally. And of course it's happening because the amount of change that we have undergone, yeah. right, is, is just so, so intense mm. that if you've made it through the change, let's call that the cultural creative class, let's call those the coastals, right? You, you know, what's his name, O'Rourke. But let's, if you've made it through the change, right, and really thought about the cost of this change to millions and millions of people who are your fellow citizens, you wouldn't be able to get up in the morning. And so we have to repress that. We mm -hmm. have to disassociate that. And, and by the same token, if you're on the other side and the, the level of humiliation and this, I mean, could you imagine that we've labeled m m uh, millions and millions of people, right? Non-college educated white people. Think about what we've taken a human being and we've said, here's who you are. You're a non-college educated white person, right? Mm. You might as well just say, you're a nothing. Why don't we just say, here there are nothings, by the way, deplorables. Yeah. We actually did that, right? Yeah, right? Yeah. But now that's splitting. And in that case, the only way to heal splitting is, and now here's what Kurt does right, is, is to have conversations, but they're very difficult. It's not about helping somebody else. That's something else. You got to feed people. You got to clothe people. It's doing the hard inner work of, mm. oh my God, the reason I think you're such an asshole is because there's a part of me that's been ashamed of my assholicness. Mm -hmm. And I have to own that. Now, culturally, that's a very big job. That's why everyone's in the drama now. You I know, Aaron, it, this also reminds me, though, and, and hidden inside of what you just said, not so much hidden, I think, but it just it, it, it resonated with me, is that somehow, and I think religion has come up with methods to do this as a technology that was an early invention or who knows, not an invention of some 
part of the universe, um, uh, has helped with forgiveness. And and um, you know, and I and I, I believe that the next administration, whoever it is, is going to have to do a truth and reconciliation yes. commission in some dimension. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And because I think if we demonize and put the other, and even if it is ourselves or a piece of ourselves, it right. can get so much that you can't go back. Or right. how, how do we, and I so, think, I mean, the problem is that, the, tell me about that. the fundamental technology of forgiveness that Western religions used, okay, and it's different than Buddhism and everything, but, but mm -hmm. the fundamental technology was you either experienced, believed, or projected and believed a mm -hmm. character that knew you fully. Right, we call that character mm. not Facebook these days. We should call it God. Right, that God knows you perfectly. That God knows your innermost secret. God, God knows even what you don't even realize you're ashamed of. That God knows you mm. fully. Okay. Now, if we're bullshitting about it, then it doesn't work anymore as a technology. But for other, those of us who really believe, there's this, or at least we could do live as if we're known completely and still loved. And once we are forgiven. We then, the splits are healed. It's easier to forgive. By the way, that's how you know when the technology is working. When you feel forgiven enough, you then can forgive, right? Mm. And But when those technologies are not available to people, right? The vast majority of people are not using forgiveness technologies. We have a bunch of new age forgiveness technologies. Some work, some don't work. So is there a civics? And I think this is a very interesting moment on how Biden will react and, and how the far, far, the, the people who have split most will react, mm -hmm. right? Because when in, in South Africa, it's not like everybody was in favor of what Bishop, I was on the Tutu Foundation. It's not like everybody agreed with Bishop Tutu that we should have right. truth and reconciliation, right? By the way, on both mm. sides, right? And mm -hmm. not everybody agreed in Rwanda, right? I was at mm. two of those in, a, in two villages of those truth and reconciliations. Let me tell you, real truth and reconciliation isn't like new age, let's forgive and make nice. It is fierce. When we talk mm. about fierce grace, right? The techno religions, historically, religions, technology of forgiveness was fierce grace, not sloppy mm. grace, yeah. fierce grace. So if we're not going to use religion, where's that fear? Who's going to model the fierce grace so that we mm. can begin to heal the splits and forgive each other, which means give each other and then begin to move the drama and, mm. and, and play together again like real people. You're yeah. saying this is tough, real, engaging work. Oh my God. Yeah. We've avoided you can't outsource virtue. You can't you can't outsource mm. right the tough work of life. You can't do that. Mm. One of the great things I, the thing about America is, is that for a, there was a, bl a blip that you can call it from post-war till and, and the historians of the site when that is. It could be Carter, it could be Reagan, that you didn't have to do this work. That's the truth. Things were because just so the amazing. Because was at our back and because right. there was, yeah. Right. Let's and by the way, even for the marginalized communities, yeah. they were even experiencing, not fast enough, of course, because no marginalized community will ever feel it fast enough because no people with power will ever give up power fast enough. That's how it works. So mm. does it, it, and that's the pacing game, right? And, mm. but, but so, but then at some point people begin to say, yikes, right? They haven't done the work. You have, it's like, if you don't do the work in your marriage for 10, 20 years, it's amazing. If you don't do your work with your siblings or your brother or your, or your kids, it's amazing. If you don't do the work in your culture and your organization, Right? What, what gives both of you hope, you know, Cordell and Irwin, as you look forward for the next four years, you know, Peter's frame from when he was talking to Kat, what would you double down on? What would you, if you wrote a letter from the concerned atomic scientists right after we dropped a bomb on Hiroshima or whatever, you know, what would you write as a letter from your constituency to the new administration? What would you say, we must do this, and it gives me hope if we can actually do this? What would it be? What Cordell? I, I um, uh, well, what gives me the most hope is, is frankly, the the activism that we are seeing. Mm. Uh, people that are are leveraging um, the the levers of our democratic systems for change, and then you have people on the other side that are nakedly so uh, saying that oh, we don't want all votes counted. Well, that's not a defensible position in America. It's not going to age well. It will, it will haunt them for the rest of their lives. 
Uh, and so if, if I were speaking to the uh, president elect uh, Biden and, uh, and uh, vice president Harris, I would agree with you, Mickey. I think truth and reconciliation is absolutely needed. I would, um, I would advocate creating regional commissions, uh, all mm -hmm. using the same script, uh, having those tough conversations uh, all over America simultaneously and repeatedly, just over and over and over again. We're going to practice humanity until we get it. Mm -hmm. hmm. That's great. Um, I, I guess what gives me hope um, is one, uh, so many people voted in the, in the midst of a pandemic. Uh -huh. uh, two, that the thousands of Democrats and Republicans who work together in polling places to count, to regulate, to, to, to be accountable to each other, and that we didn't have one act of violence in one polling place in the United States. And those were Democrats and Republicans working together to do the counting and to do the monitoring. I think that is a profound moment of hope. Three, the anomalies of this election. Uh, we had uh, uh, a Republican Party that got more minority votes than um, since, like, since Nixon in 1960. Uh, and we have a Democratic Party that was able to get uh, white working class uh, uh, voters. So I think those are, that, those are anomalies that we really uh, need to take seriously. Mm -hmm. Four, uh, if I was writing one thing to Biden, uh, or, or let me give you two things. One is do not think of our side and their side is monolithic, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You have been in this business for 47 years. You have helped people on every side of the divide bury parents and bury children and bury spouses. You understand that there isn't 70 million people, 65 million people who voted Trump are not monolithic, just like the 72 million people that voted for you are not monolithic, right? So begin mm -hmm. to parse and, 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 and give the, larger dignity, right? Don't generalize the others. And the last thing is, if you're going to do this truth and reconciliation, the most important thing is to model it yourself. If you think this is going to happen without you being able to get up and say, I'm, I, I know even I'm going to only do this four more years. I hope that I'm healthy enough to get through the four years. I'm going to model this by saying, if I knew everything that I knew now, I, 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 that, that crime bill, uh, I... I I also need to be honest, I live in Delaware where there is so much, there's so much cronyism and capitalism. And I and it's no one's it's not because people are immoral, it's because it's really hard. Right. I would have three or four things that would be really hard that he models. And if it's not modeled from the top, right, it'll mm -hmm. actually backfire. Yeah. Uh, Cordell, um, is, if we think yeah. back in history, who are examples of presidents or leaders that kind of had perspectives like this that then seeped into our American identity? Oh, I think of Dwight D. Eisenhower, uh, who was incredibly progressive on, on uh, racial harmony. Uh, we, we remember the uh, more uh, bellicose activities, you know, sending in 104th Airborne. What we don't know um, is that he battled LBJ and BFK to pass the Civil Rights Bill of 1957. Uh, they wanted it watered down because they were running for office. They wanted his job and they didn't want to antagonize the Southern Democratic senators. And he went right at him. He went and they were like, hey, you're going to the Republicans are going to lose in the South. He said, this is the right thing to do. And that filtered down uh, through his administration, through his choices. He had the first first uh, black assistant secretary, I believe of labor at the time. Uh, and so I, I think I think of him as a person that modeled uh, some tremendous leadership that filtered down. You made an interesting point earlier at the, at the top of our conversation, everyone, before you were here, you said, we are not America without our differences. And that's striking because probably <laughs> half of America would think of those as fighting words. And yet yeah. that's what it means to be a pluralist Republic from everywhere. Yeah. I mean, the, the other side of, of love is hate. The other side of, of difference is innovation. And so there's a good reason why we're some of the most creative, innovative people uh, in, in the world. We're, we're so different that you have to think out of the box. And so that dynamism uh, of our uh, mm. this great experiment called the United States of America 
I mean, we're forgetting what makes us great. We yeah. really are. Well, I mean, but this is amazing, I think, too. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, go ahead. I, think, I, I, I mean, Cordell, yes, 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 yes. De Tocqueville writes about that the cacophony of associations is uh -huh. what makes America. And then yeah. there's, a, there's an amazing letter, uh, speech, that, that, that um, John Quincy Adams gives uh, at the 50th year anniversary of George Washington's installation as, as president. He gives it at the New York Historical Society, which is like eight blocks from here. And he talks about um, the possibility that there'll be a moment in America where the United States becomes, and these are his words, the disunited states. And I'll put the thing, I'll put the thing in the chat. Disunited mm -hmm. states, because we will come, the bonds of affection will uh, erode, he writes, and, and we will mm -hmm. come to hate each other. And at that moment, we ought not coerce each other. We ought to disband and become the disunited states. Now, it's a fascinating because that means he's looking at what's going on in, in 1836. And he's saying, mm -hmm. you know, we got some issues here. And he's inviting people to understand that, that mm -hmm. the deep debates are necessary. That's what we were never a monolithic country. We did not base ourselves on ethnicity. We did not base ourselves on soil. We did not base our blood uh, on blood. We did not base kin. It is a unique experiment. And by the way, of course, it's a hard experiment because we are out of the many one, but that's a half truth. We're mm -hmm. out of the many one, and then out of the one we're many, and then out of the many we're one, and then out of the one we're many, and it's an ongoing drama of one and many and many and mm. one and one and many. And when you're in the one, it feels great. They'll always know when we're in the one, there are people who are outside. Don't yeah. think they're people. And when we're in mm. the many, right, Don't. it's easy to imagine because we're in the many that we've forgotten the one. So, so both yeah, of you have I, made I, me I, think I, of yeah, two yeah, things that one, feel one, oh, one well, just one step further, yeah. you know, I, I like to remind our uh, participants and especially the Becoming Inclusive Republic uh, seminar that we are 244 years old and that is but a baby in nation state. Mm. Right? And so there's a good reason you can have very different conversations, say in China, where you have 8,000 years of history. <laughs> Uh, even in France with 1,200 years of history, then in the U.S., we are still mm. figuring this out. We are becoming mm. beloved community. We're on our way there. And right. it can happen in our lifetime. Right. The job of our lives is to do something that is additive to that outcome. Right. It's like the, it's, I, I always use the, the sort of, the, it, when you really understand what Cordell, I mean, Cordell does, when we really do understand what Cordell just challenged us with, you understand that these, these myths of not getting into the promised land, that Moses doesn't get into the promised land. And it's not that he's a failed leader, right? He <laughs> dies looking in, and then the next generation dies looking mm. in. And the next, because even when you get to the promised land, you realize, oh my God, it's not as promised as I thought, because I still have to do a lot of work. And, and that's, only America has that drama. We have a lot of problems with it, but that particular drama, yeah. right? It's never fixed here because mm. all the fixed stuff, blood and ground and land, it, we just didn't make that what this is about. It's about a idea that's constantly, that's crazy. It is crazy if you think about it. Mm -hmm. and, but I love I love both. So uh, I, I, got, I brought two things away from, I mean, I just am nodding my head here. But Cordell, you talked about we are not America without our differences. And, you know, my, the other hat I wear is as a senior advisor at a place called Boston Consulting Group. And we've put out, I think, five years worth of proof in the market, in the market of the business and whatever, that, that cognitive diversity outperforms uh, a monolithic cognition. In other words, everyone from like a Western school, white, whatever, Mm -hmm. outperforms by 15 to 20% in the market, right? And the reason cognitive diversity outperforms is something in biology we call hybrid vigor. When you have a monoculture and, and life is the same, it's actually pretty good. You can evolve into that stress level and you can yeah. do pretty well. When there is ambiguity, when there is change, um, monocultures disappear like the dodos, like the Galapagos Island, like, you know, they, they disappear like Easter Island. And consequently, hybrid vigor is what this country was based on. Now, we didn't get it perfect and we've got a lot of work there. But 
I think we have to remember that, you know, we've got 3 billion years of R&D behind this idea of hybrid vigor. It's called yeah. life on right. Earth. Yeah. And we need to start thinking about how do we, in a sense, co-design with nature rather than trying to brute force so one of the either human nature or or just nature nature so that we can actually have a planet to look at it. But Mickey, one of the things then really, if and, and I agree with you, that the cognitive diversity outperforms, we all know that when we're in interesting conversations, when we go to college for the first time, many of us, and meet people who are different from us, and we stay up all night in the dorm room, and like, oh my God, you did that? And that's, oh my God, right? oh my God, oh my God, wow, right? And, 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 and I love hybrid vigor, but it turns out that kind of change it's not change that's the problem. No one has a problem with change. People have a problem with loss. And if you do not mm -hmm. manage the loss, mm -hmm. and I would say the society hasn't been fantastic at managing the loss, especially in a hyper moment of change, because more people have met more people across boundaries in the last 40 years than the previous 200 years of the country, mm -hmm. right? So it's not simply meeting people. It's that as we begin to instantiate cultural diver cognitive diversity, right? And cultural diversity and ethnic diversity and religious, as we begin to instantiate that, right? You can't help but be creative, but in the creativity, there is always loss. There's always people left behind. And so managing yeah. the loss, managing the loss, those people who love cognitive diversity, those people who love innovation, those people who love change, our job, because I think we are, we're, we're amongst those people. And by the way, don't think they, right, are not like to, they're innovating too. No, funny, no, it's all right? of us. If, yeah. you're, if you're poor, right, and figuring out how to feed your children and raise decent kids, you're as innovative as anybody in Silicon Valley. Let okay. me be clear about that, okay? Mm. So that's another thing. Cognitive diversity mm -hmm. is more than just two different ways of thinking. It's yeah, also recognizing. Yeah. So our ability to really take seriously managing the loss, mitigating well, some you know, vulnerability. Ooh, very in, powerful. But, but related to this, I, I feel like you you actually, you know, with me, helped me in April. And honestly, of course, it's going to be years while I'm grappling with this. We all do this with loss. But you helped me kind of understand that loss was a kind, and this sounds weird sometimes, a kind of technology that religion brings. And you mentioned something called the Kaddish. Kaddish. I don't know if I'm pronouncing yeah, that right. Kaddish, yeah. But tell me, say what that is, because because I, I want to understand. Oh, it's just a very, of, it's the most traditional, yeah. it's the most traditional Jewish prayer said uh, by someone who's grieving for an immediate relative, a parent, a child, whatever. And the the, the prayer doesn't say uh, anything about the dead. It has to be said in a group. So already that it has to be said in 10 people mean, means mm -hmm. the system is saying, this technology says you cannot think your way out of cross. You need to be loved out of loss. You need to you be need loved out of loss. With you. You, need to yeah. be, you need to be loved and nurtured and, and mm -hmm. loved. And the prayer, and it comes at the end of, the, of prayer services three times a day, literally assumes that there's a rent in the universe. That if someone you love died, the cosmos mm -hmm. is damaged. Forget about you. Mm -hmm. The yeah. cosmos is damaged. And the prayer says, now you have to believe in the metaphysics. You have to buy in, at least let yourself surrender to the metaphysics, right? Because otherwise you can't play the game, right, <laughs> to, to bring Cat in. But you, the cosmos has a rent. The cosmos has a hole, mirroring the hole that you're feeling. And you go, may the cosmos be whole again. May the cosmos be great again. May God, because God is in the prayer, really, is the one that has a rent. There's a tear, right, in reality itself in God. And so you say, may God be great again, because obviously God's been diminished in the loss of somebody I love. May God be magnified mm. again, right? May everything be, be whole again. May everything be blessed again, because there's a recognition that the loss is really real. It's not a game. You can't think your way out of it. It's forever, okay? But it can be. You know, it's like the cactus that's wounded that grows a different way. And if you saw a cactus straight up, you wouldn't, that would, you'd never look at it again. It's not an interesting cactus, right? Mm -hmm. The cactus is that it grows and, like this. And you use, you know, sort of God, reality, and the universe interchangeably, because the point is, this is not a right. loss of, for you. No. This was a loss for the universe. And I think that's really where we are right now. We, we are probably facing a lot of really, you know, personal losses 
But we also, as a teenager, in, in our evolution as a society, as this experiment has gone, we are facing some tear in the universe uh -huh. that is that has maybe been sometimes slow and sometimes fast. The last comment I, I have, and I know, Peter, you have something in here, but when you said, uh, Rabbi Irwin, you said something that was kind of a loop. You said, um, you know, something about yourself and something about the other and something about yourself, you know, it was a, it was a looping idea. And, and it was that notion that we are many, we are one, we are many, we are one, you know, this, this idea. And this reminds me deeply of, oddly enough, maybe, uh, Douglas Hofstetter, who wrote the book, Girdle Escher Bach. Mm. And, and I don't know how many people have read that book. Um, it was it's required like reading. Too. Yeah, yeah it's, it, it came out of nowhere. He wrote a, a simpler book. You know, Girdle was a mathematician, Escher was an artist, and Bach played music. And it was about this beautiful braid that is about what's called a strange loop. And the idea of a strange loop even goes to consciousness. And he wrote a, a smaller piece when he lost his wife, actually, too young. Uh, and he wondered, the idea of a strange loop is that it jumps levels. It loops. Right. It goes from, from this to another level of meta-ness. So rock, paper, scissor, right? That's a strange loop because there's no top. You know, uh, rock is covered by paper, but but scissor can cut paper, but but you know, rock can do you know, and so it's a it's called a strange loop. It's a it's a phenomena, but we believe consciousness comes out of the feedback loop of us looking at ourselves, looking at the world, looking at ourselves, and when something else kind of comes into our little camera view in a feedback loop, we see Rabbi Irwin, but we only see a few pixels because I've only met you once. But I, then I see you a little more if you fall into my loop. And when you leave, you're still in my loop. You know, it's like two cameras. If you did this with two iPhones, you'd actually see this works. If somebody brings a new camera yeah. into the feedback loop and walks away, because of the time delay of consciousness, it stays there. And his question was, is she still here running in some degraded fractal form in my strange loop when we lost her? If we get together at a funeral, are we all recreating her as a as a phenomenon in the universe? Because it's not like you can cut a brain and find consciousness. So is it just running? Is this strange loop running? And and I think what you just described about America, America is a strange loop. Mm. It is it mm. is it is me, it is e pluribus unum, it is us, it is we, but it's the act of that feedback loop. And maybe the delays in the feedback loop, you know. Churchill said that democracy is the worst form of government except for everything else we've tried because maybe of the delay. You know, it, it isn't voting for American Idol. And and consciousness doesn't work unless we have actually a time delay for that. The memory is stored inside of the loop itself. And it's anyway, just a, a thought. Peter, Beautiful. go. Oh, Beautiful. Well, you know, it's also the belief in the fiction that then makes it real. You talk about you have to believe in the metaphysics of God for that system to work, and one has to believe in the idea of America and that it's imperfect, but if you believe in the idea and the fact that America is always about becoming, then you give yourself agency uh, within the game. In fact, in, in Homo Deus, that was one of the great discoveries, right. that we right. invent right. these fictions. Stories, right. That's they, why Doc Rivers, the, if you ask me what was the most important speech, I'm 62 years old, if you wake me up at the end of my life, what was one of the most important speeches you ever heard in your entire life? It'll be Doc Rivers after George Floyd, the day after or two days after. This tough guy is a basketball coach. He's like a serious guy. He, he's a dis he disciplines people. He holds everybody accountable. And he just wept and he said, do you realize it's so remarkable that we still love this country? <laughs> and, 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 he had so bought, I get goosebumps because he had bought into the fiction, right, of America. A group of people then tell a story and they try to live out the story because you author the story and then the story has authority over you. And, and, and he so bought into the story. I would imagine, I'm going to say this as respectfully, I can, there are many, 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 many white, liberal, successful Americans who don't believe in the story a 10% that Doc Rivers does. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we better figure out who the models who really do believe in this story are. And that's the, and there's a diverse models. Yeah.
right? Mm. There, are, there are diverse models, not the people who've given up on the story and who hate the story. They have a role to play, okay? Mm. Because everyone has a role to play in the sandbox, but not everybody, right, has, everybody has equal voice, but not everybody has equal say. And, and mm. a Doc Rivers, we should start nothing in this country without hearing those kinds of voices. Um, I want to thank all of you for um, changing the tone of this frenetic mid-election liminal moment. Um, in a way, Erwin, this has been kind of a, a Sabbath for the ex election moment to let us sit back and give us the agency on where to take things. And I think that was, by the way, that was the intent of today's show, which we had no idea what show we were telling because we couldn't tell what was going on in America. And then around noon, I sent you an email. And right, right. You, Carter. <laughs> um, I want to end up on one thing. Omi, can we put up uh, Bob Putnam's new book? Um, uh, the the, the, the uh, Robert Putnam, who, of course, wrote Bowling Alone, has this uh, a new book called The Upswing, uh, which is about how America came together a century ago and can do it again. And he kind of traces this whole Tocquevillian thing, Tocquevillian thing that we all came together. And, and he points out that the uncoming together actually started in the last Gilded Age with all wealth disparity. And whereas we often point that to that mid-century moment when you said we've come together as, as the New Deal, it in fact was the progressive era with Teddy Roosevelt in cahoots with the journalists that looked at wealth disparity and looked at child labor and said, we have to mid-course correct capitalism, mm -hmm. right? And then that, and then he also talks about how that, and Cordell, we talk about this so much, this over-indexed at some point for, for community. We had so much community going on that we started rebelling against it. And right. it wasn't the Reagans that started doing it. It was actually the, the hippies in the 60s correct. and individualism, which then culminated, mm -hmm. you know, 10 or 15 years ago. And the great question now is, and of course, the article of the, the, the name of this article is from I to We and Back Again. So they were already picking up on your Godel Eschel Bach recursive mm -hmm. reference. Um, Cordell, I don't know if, if, if Putnam was speaking at the Ideas Festival this year, but, but his new book almost seems like a textbook or a manifesto or a guide for what's next. I, I agree. I agree. You know, um, First of all, I loved his uh, book, Bowling Alone. I think he's just a fantastic thinker and um, very comprehensive in his approach. And I'm excited to read that book. But I, I suspect uh, there'll be a huge appetite in terms of content in 2021 for something or anything that speaks to bringing us back together. Um, I, I like to say that our presidents are a reflection of who we are. And I, I think the same is true with the, the last three years and several months. That is who we are as a people, as a nation. Now it's time to be more aspirational and like, who could we be? And who we could be is, is a more unified nation. So I, I, I'm definitely gonna pick up the book and hopefully be inspired to, to build some content off of it. The most important part of the book is that it mitigates our anxiety that this is brand new, that yeah. this is the loop. This mm. is, these are these cycles of consolidation and deconsolidation and consolidation and deconsolidation of inclusiveness and fear and exclusion, inclusiveness and exclusion, that these are dances. And the most important thing then is to know who you are in the drama of that dance. Mm. Who do you want to be? Right. And, and here's where I think Spider-Man has something to teach us. And that is whoever has, experience themselves as having more power. I mean, you do have more responsibility. We do. Mm. We do. It's just, it, 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 we okay, do. Okay, Erwin, I just gotta, I gotta stop there on the Spider-Man reference. So um, just like a week ago, because this is the quarantine, um, we rewatched Into the Spider-Verse, which I have to tell you, I mean, it won an Oscar for, for computer animation and special effects because it used everything on the planet in terms of comic book style. And they had lots of different people involved. And frankly, I have to tell you, it is a beautiful exploration. It's called Into the Spider-Verse because there's a rent in the universe and there are many different Spider-Men. There's a Spider-Woman, there's a spider oh, wow. girl, there's a spider uh, Looney Tunes pig, there's a spider, you know, a uh, black and white person, you know, that, that is only in noir spider world. And, and, and it turns out, and it generally, it deserves the Oscar. 
it's it's but but I I just I just wanted to reference that because we're we're also I'm gonna watch it over further, the weekend. <laughs> further reading, I guarantee you, you will watch this to the end and be like, what? Great. That it it actually is quite good. Um, okay, I know we're getting late for everybody. Um, any last words, Cordell, Irwin, Peter? Well, I, I just encourage my fellow Americans to be hopeful, uh, to be active. Uh, we all have to do our parts. Mm. That will lead us to uh, yeah, a back. better place. I don't know where that's from. Sorry, America. Uh, I'm sorry, um, but um, I, I hope people share my optimism uh, because great things are happening around us, and we are capable of even greater things. And so let's just get out there and make something happen for our democracy. I'll say two things: be mm. curious and serve. Be curious and serve. Be curious mm. and serve. Be curious about other people. Be curious about what you disagree with. Be curious about what you don't understand. Be curious about what you're scared of. Just be curious, be curious, be curious. Start slow if it's too scary, but be curious, be curious, and serve, serve, serve. There's always someone, right? Mm. I'm not saying transform the world. No transformation in the world. Serve, right? If everybody be curious and serve, we will have another one of those renaissances. Mm. Thank you. Thank you all for a most American moment. Uh, we, we came together when we thought there was some enormous conflict. Uh, and then we realized we had more participation than ever before. And in the midst of a pandemic and a Russian hacking mechanism and a social media shitstorm, our local institutions seem to have gotten us to a point. And today we realize it's kind of a launching point into that always becoming. Mm. Uh, and so th this was really inspiring. And I think, uh, you know, Mickey and I were talking earlier, th this is really the next season of this show and the work that we need to do. And um, so, uh, th this is terrific. Thank you. you know, Cordell, nice I was thinking finale. earlier that, you know, you were pointing out how, what is it going to be like in the Mitch and, and, and Biden show? But it occurred to me when JFK came to office, he had just as tough a problem with the Senate. Oh, yeah. For the Voting Rights Act, which is about where we are again. So Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Right. Just remember, Mitch McConnell was the only Republican Senate, a Republican who came to Hunter Biden's funeral. To Bo Biden's funeral. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So he came to the funeral. When we bury each other's dead, we're not just enemies. Whatever else we are, we're not just enemies. And it is now 6.51, no, 5.51 <laughs> Pacific Quarantine time. Thank you all for spending Friday night with us. Thank you. We're back mm -hmm. next week talking about what it means to build transformational technologies and flourishing cities. The technology, in fact, of transformation, or what we were talking about before. Uh, and then we will continue this journey. Thank you, Mick. Thanks, Cordell. Thanks, Erwin. Anything Thanks else? Nice to, you. Thanks nice to meet you, Thanks Cordell. Nice to meet you. Thanks, everybody. Be well. Likewise. Bye. Oh, me take us out to the mellifluous tunes of uh, of the quarantine song. Let's get close, but not so close. Quarantine. You can share from a distance. Quarantine. You know we want to see each other. We'll have to stay in your corner. Space while we talk.